So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm very, very pleased <coughs> and excited to have uh, Professor Jose Medina with us. He's come all the way from Northwestern University in Chicago. Um, he has published very, very widely in critical race theory, gender and queer theory, communication theory, social epistemology, and political philosophy. Um, and in particular, his book, The Epistemology of Resistance, um, received the 2012 North American Society for Social Philosophy Book Award. Um, so his current projects in critical race theory, social epistemology, and gender and queer theory focus on how social perception and the social imagination contribute to the formation of vulnerabilities to different kinds of violence and oppression. Um, these projects also explore social movements and kinds of activism, including epistemic activism, that can be mobilized to resist racial and sexual violence and oppression in local and global contexts. So please join me in welcoming Professor Medina. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me here and for organizing this wonderful conference, Robin. Thank you, everybody, for being here with me. Um, with us uh, here together for this discussion. So let me just say very quickly something about the title and what the focus of the presentation is going to be on. So I'm going to be talking about responsibility for racial violence, but my primary concern will not be the responsibility of those who perpetrate violence, although of course bringing to justice the perpetrators of violence is uh, crucial, right? And making sure that violence doesn't happen with impunity is crucial. But my focus will not be that. My focus will be on a notion of responsibility that's broader um, and, and more diffuse than that, that has to do with sharing responsibility uh, and community responsibility. So let me give you an example so you will see right away the kind of responsibility I'm talking about. And this comes from a case study uh, published by Alison Bailey in the article, Community Responsibility for Racial Violence. So in the 90s, in the early 90s, in a white working class neighborhood outside Philadelphia, a black, a black family moved in, uh, and they would be harassed, uh, graffiti on their walls, broken windows, and then some members of the neighborhood would come out to talk to journalists, and they would go on record saying in the newspapers and on t the local TV, oh, that's too bad that this is happening, but we're not a racist neighborhood, we're not a racist community, it's a few bad apples, uh, and it's too bad, but we're not racist. But that kept happening, and in fact, one black family after another would be harassed, and they would have to move out of the neighborhood. So part of the problem here is that clearly there is a failure of responsibility that is happening already in saying, we don't condone violence, we didn't do it, so this is not our problem. And notice that the failure of responsibility there is a failure of solidarity. Not caring enough, not feeling like that, that problem is your problem, and not making yourself accountable for the pattern of violence and not responding to it. So independently of who did what, right, if that is happening in your community, you should feel responsible for it. And going on record, distancing yourself, extricating yourself from the problem is already a way of showing that it's not your problem, right? That you have nothing to say about it and that you're not gonna do anything about it. And notice that one of the reasons why the problem continued was not only because the people perpetrating that violence uh, were not caught by the police, uh, but it also kept happening because a number of failures, the failures of the institutions, including the police, to protect that family, uh, to find the perpetrators, but also the failures of the community not to do everything within their power to change the community. And whatever those responses would be, right? Uh, creating a neighborhood watch, or even just simply expressing to those black families that that was happening to them, that that was happening to the whole community, right? That they were there with them. So that kind of responsibility, shared responsibility that the community should feel, is the one I'm gonna be focusing on. Then also for the subtitle of the talk, as you can see here, shooting is in italics. And the reason for that is because I'm not going to be talking about shooting with guns, but rather shooting with cameras. And I'm going to talk about the role of images, both in the creation of vulnerabilities to racial violence, 
how visual communication and a visual imaginary can stigmatize certain people and, make, uh, and can make certain groups of people vulnerable to violence. But also, as you will see, in the sense that we can also turn those stigmatizing images and those distorted forms of disability against themselves, and we can use cameras in our own activism, right, photo activism. So I'll come back to that. Uh, so the talk I'll divide into three parts, and I'll have to go very quickly to make sure that we uh, get time for some questions. Uh, but as you, will, as you will see, and you have it there in front of you already, what the roadmap is, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to focus on uh, the notion of racial violence and also different forms of complicity with racial violence, and I'll give you an argument for shared responsibility. And there is a distinction to be made between shared responsibility and collective responsibility. A lot of the literature on collective responsibility assigns responsibility to a collective body, whether the collective body is the nation, the corporation, an entity of that sort, or an entire community like a city. But typically, collective responsibility means the entire collective is responsible. And then the question is, how are you going to distribute that responsibility? Is it going to be the particular people who represent that community or collective, like the head of the state, or, or how are you going to do it? And I'm interested in a different notion of responsibility that has to do with sharing. And what that means is participating in that responsibility. And for that, the issue of positionality, what position do you occupy in your community, in that collective body, and what kind of relationality do you have with the pattern of violence is going to be crucial because people are going to share responsibility in different ways. Uh, and I'll get to that. And the model I'm going to be working with, the model I'm shaping of shared responsibility, is what I call the enablers model, that I will contrast with the bystander model. So I'll get to that in a minute. But that will be the main philosophical argument about responsibility, and all of that will be in section one. In a way, the other two sections are a way of expanding that argument and illustrating that argument with a particular case study. Uh, what I'm going to do in section two is to focus on how photography was used by the lynching, the pro-lynching movement at the beginning of the 20th century and the role that photography played in creating cultural practices of racial violence around lynching. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how lynching photography worked, what the legacy of that lynching photography is for the visibility or hyper-visibility of racial violence. Uh, and in particular, let me just mention this from the beginning so that you know uh, that I'm uh, narrowing the focus of the analysis in that way. In particular, I'm going to be talking about lynching again, uh, that, that happened uh, targeting African-American men, right? Because there is a particular issue there. So that's going to be the focus, although I will connect it also with other forms of racial violence and other forms of lynching. For example, lynching of uh, Mexican-Americans and Latinos along the southern border, also lynching of Asian-Americans and people of Asian descent on the Pacific coast. But notice that I'm going very explicitly try to uh, make the focus of the analysis narrow in gender terms and in racial terms. In gender terms by focusing on men and in racial terms by focusing on African-American men. Now, women were lynched as well. But it's really, and women of color particularly, were, were lynched. But it's interesting that the lynching happened very differently. And there was no cultural spectacle, no visual spectacle of, lynching, uh, uh, of the lynching of women, right? Lynching photography was always photographies of, uh, photographs of uh, African-American male victims. And that becomes really important because there is that problematic back and forth between the invisibility of lynching and the hypervisibility of lynching, right? And I'm going to argue also, I'm going to suggest for consideration that even that very problematic uh, back and forth between those two forms of distorted visibility, invisibility and hypervisibility, keeps happening today with uh, police brutality and police homicides uh, in the case of black men, but not so much women of color. In the case of women of color, it remains practically invisible. And there is no cultural spectacle around it, right? And the lynching of women of color, for the most part, happened by burning, and there were no remains, and there were no pictures taken. In the case of men, however, men of color, and in particular African-American men, it became a spectacle, right? And I'm going to argue that the spectacle itself 
is a form of symbolic violence and is a form of continuing the perpetration of violence generation after generation. And then in the last section, I'm gonna argue that there are different forms of activism that we can engage in in order to disarm and stop the spectacle of racial violence. And in particular, a, 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 a activism that goes against the legacy of lynching photography and the spectacle of racial violence. And I will use a, a visual artist, Ken Gonzalez Day, but also some images and reflections that come from Black Lives Matter. Okay. So section one, racial violence and complicity. Uh, it is important to point out that obviously violence has all kinds of aspects and dimensions to, be, uh, to begin with physical violence and that has to remain center stage, that has to, be, to remain uh, uh, in the foreground. Uh, what happens to actual bodies, the suffering of actual bodies. Uh, but then obviously there is emotional and psychological violence, symbolic violence, social violence agential violence, institutional violence, economic and material violence, and also I highlight their epistemic violence, right? Which is the violence that happens to a subject of, or a group in terms of their capacities to know, to understand, to be heard, to be visible. Uh, and in particular, for the purposes of my talk, I'm going to connect physical violence and epistemic violence. And I want to start with this uh, quote uh, from James Baldwin in the introduction of The Fire Next Time. And he says, this is the crime of which I accuse my country and my countrymen, and for which neither I nor time nor history will ever forgive them. That they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives, and they do not know it, and do not want to know it. It is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence which constitutes the crime. So notice that he's emphasizing that on the one hand you have the pattern of violence and devastation itself, but then on top of that, you have a, what I call an epistemic harm, which is cultivating ignorance about it, looking the other way, pretending not to know, and not wanting to know, right? And that protects the violence, right? And that creates a particular mindset, right, that uh, enables violence. And that uh, the pretended innocence, right, that he's criticizing, becomes also a crime, or part of the, the, the crime. Uh, this is not fully responding for some reason. Oh, okay, now I guess I have to be close to the computer. Okay, so I wanna talk about responsibility, as I said, in a very broad way, shifting from the focus on issues like culpability and attributability, whether or not something can be attributed to you, and whether or not you have chosen to do such a thing, and here I'm relying on a really exciting body of literature uh, that includes uh, articles by uh, Robinson uh, in which he talks about how uh, we can understand responsibility for racial, uh, for uh, well, implicit bias uh, and acting on implicit bias even beyond whether or not those actions can be attributed to you, you are still accountable for them. So I'm interested in responsibility in, in that broad sense of accountability, but also in the sense of responsivity, being able to respond to uh, what has happened, whether you did it or not, right? Uh, and then I'm also interested in the literature in collective responsibility, including my former colleague at Vanderbilt, before I moved to Northwestern, Larry May, uh, but also, as I mentioned before, the literature on community responsibility. And this is a quote from the article by Alison Bailey where she says, homogenized approaches to responsibility overlook the important political and cultural fact that hate crimes have systematic backing. That you shouldn't just think about hate crimes as things that a few bad apples do, a few isolated people happen to engage in. You should see the systematic backing behind those acts. If we understand racism as a complex system of domination that is systematically created and culturally nourished, and is reducible to the attitudes and actions of a few bad people, then it makes sense to frame responsibilities in ways that not only hold individuals, individual perpetrators responsible, but also take into account the systematic dimensions of injustice and the role that communities play in keeping these systems in place. So if you think about hate crimes, uh, and in particular racial violence in this broad sense, 
In order to stop that kind of violence, you have to deal not only with the individuals who commit that violence, but with the systematic backing behind those individuals, how a culture of violence has, be, has been put in place, and how you need to displace it. Okay? Now, for the entire argument I'm going to develop, the work of Christian List and Philip Pettit, in particular, on group agency becomes really important. How is it that groups may be acting through particular individuals? How is it that there is group agency? And this is important in order to understand how racial violence happens, but it's also important in order to understand how to stop racial violence. How activists, right, how people who are committed to stopping racial violence have to act together. What does that mean, right? And notice that in that book, right, by List and Pettit, there is the very important, this is where I'm drawing uh, the inspiration of my account, there, there is a very important discussion of enabling violence, right? You may not yourself uh, perpetrate any violent act, but you may be, perhaps without knowing it, contributing to the perpetration of that harm by others. You may be enabling uh, the perpetration of the harm in all kinds of ways, in the way you talk, in the way you look the other way, in the way you uh, recirculate certain scripts and images, and so on. So that's what I'm interested in. Now, OK. One model, probably the most developed model in political philosophy and in philosophy of law, that deals with issues of collective responsibility is the bystander model. right? And Larry May, my former colleague, is one of the people uh, who developed that, that model in philosophy of law and in political philosophy. And in that model, notice that the first thing that happens is that you have three elements when you start analyzing a harm. You have the victims and the perpetrators, and voila, there are other people who you have to care about, right? Other people you can ascribe responsibility to who are the people standing by the sides, the bystanders, okay? And of course, that becomes and uh, has become a very important model for assigning legal responsibilities. And that's what Larry says in that quote, uh, that even if you don't have dirty hands, even if you haven't done anything yourself with your hands, you may be tainted but by what has happened around you. you know? uh, now, notice that here you have only three roles, right? Which means that if you are not yourself a victim, of a harm, and you're not yourself a perpetrator of that, harm, of that harm, by definition, you're going to fall into the third category. You are a bystander. And I'm going to claim that that's not good enough. That is some kind of progress if you thought there were only two roles to pay attention to, the victim and the perpetrator. So there is some kind of progress, like, no, no, no. The people standing by the sides, those people also have to feel responsible. So there is some kind of progress. But notice one thing that is a little bit disturbing. Everybody who didn't perpetrate the harm and was not a victim of the harm falls into the same category. And I'm going to claim that that's not good enough, that we need a more nuanced analysis in which you really have to interrogate what is your positionality with respect to the harm? In what ways maybe you contribute him, perhaps even unintentionally, but actually in other cases intentionally, to the continuation of that harm? But more generally, there are three kinds of concerns that I have with the, uh, uh, I already told you about the third one, but uh, there are three different concerns that I have with the bystander model, uh, at least as it is typically used. First, that it tends to be individualistic. Either you talk about particular individuals who were there doing nothing, or you talk about entire groups. Sometimes people do that too, like the entire city, the entire collective. But you also treat these individuals or groups as mere spectators. And I'm going to claim that that's deceiving. That the people who stand by the sides right, are not always properly described as spectators. They are witnessing what is happening. Sometimes they are actually deeply involved in what is going on. right? And even if they take the position of a spectator, just taking distance and looking at what is going on, that is actually very disturbing, that somebody has become a mere spectator. And we have to interrogate what that means. But then secondly, the bystander model is typically applied in a, bug, in a retrospective way. When a harm happens, you then ask, who was a bystander? Who didn't do anything about it, even though they could have done something about it? Who was standing by the side? And I'm going to say also that that's not good enough. I mean, of course, we have to do that, right? We have 
to retrospectively examine what are the different forms of responsibility that were involved. But we have to do better than that. We don't need to wait for the harm to be committed. When there is a harm in the making, when some people are being targeted, when some people are being rendered vulnerable, you should already start assigning responsibility. And you should, in a forward-looking way, say, hey, we need to stop this discourse. We need to stop targeting immigrants, for example, in the US because you are making them vulnerable to a particular kind of violence. And you don't need to wait for the violence to be perpetrated. You have to intervene before the violence is perpetrated. And then the third point is essentially what I told you, that I'm interested in identifying different forms of complicity, different ways in which you may be involved in the harm. right? And it's not good enough to say we're all bystanders. Okay. Now, there are different forms of complicity with racial violence, but I'm interested in three ways in which complicity happens. One way is by cultivating what uh, James Baldwin was describing, right, as not wanting to know, right? Active ignorance. Not only you don't know, but you protect yourself from knowing, so that even if information comes your way, you're still going to discount that information, or you're going to reinterpret that information, or you're gonna do whatever it takes not to know, not to acknowledge right, that police brutality, for example, in the US is not simply a case of a few bad cops, that it is actually a pattern, and that there is systematic violence. So sometimes, it's root, complicity can be rooted in active ignorance. But notice, Knowing is not enough, right? And this connects with some of the discussions we were having earlier today. For example, some of the things that uh, Debbie uh, uh, and Jolene were talking about caring, right? If you do know, so you acknowledge that this is happening, but you don't care enough, right? You don't intervene, you don't do anything about it, you are apathetic, then you are still complicit with the continuation of that pattern of harm. And then finally, and this is very important too, there is another way in which you can be complicit. You can actually be contributing to the formation and continuation of vulnerability to violence. And you can do that in all kinds of ways. You can do that actively, for example, by recirculating a stigmatizing script or a stigmatizing image. For example, telling racist jokes or telling uh, demeaning, saying demeaning things about immigrants, let's say. So in that way, you are not perhaps perpetrating harm, you're not committing violence against any particular group, but you are indulging in this kind of discourse that is uh, enabling that harm. So that is an active contribution to the vulnerability, but you could also be passively contributing to, that to the formation and continuation of that vulnerability. For example, by laughing at racist jokes. For example, Maybe not laughing or cheering or doing anything, but simply letting it uh, be, right? Other people use it, you don't use it. Uh, so it's like one of the things that Republicans have been saying about Trump, right? Uh, well, uh, whether he's a racist or not, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let it be. I just vote for his policies or whatever it is, right? Okay, but precisely because you are letting it be, right, you are involved uh, uh, in, a, in an indirect and passive way. Okay. Now, another thing that I want to say, and I, I don't have time to go over all of this, is that there are certain ways of thinking about what citizenship is and what a democracy is, that by becoming a mere spectator, by becoming a, a mere bystander, you are already failing some responsibilities that you should have as a citizen, as a member of a democracy. In my view, democracy is not a spectator sport, right? If you have become a spectator, you have already fail some responsibilities that you have. And you can give an, entirely, an entire philosophical justification of this in various ways. For example, by going to the pragmatist conception of democracy that you can find in Jane Addams, in, in, in John Dewey, also uh, more contemporary versions of that you can find in Elizabeth Anderson, the account of epistemic democracy, so that you think about democracy as collective inquiry. And when you think about democracy as collective inquiry, we're all active learners, right, in that collective inquiry. And if you detach yourself from the collective inquiry, because you look the other way and you don't want to know what is going on, eh, or you take a distance with what is going on, you are already failing as a member of that eh, community of inquiry. 
And then, of course, the literature on active citizenship right, can be used here as well. OK, but in general, what I want to say is that there are many ways in which you can become an enabler of racial violence, either in an active way, inciting violence, encouraging uh, or, uh, or sharing the perpetrators of violence, justifying or excusing violence after it happens, minimizing the importance or discounting the significance or whatever it is. And then, of course, you can also become an enabler of violence uh, in a passive way. Uh, by apathy, by looking away, by inattention, by failing to respond or to repair the damage. And I want to emphasize that uh, there can be both enabling groups, enabling communities, enabling publics, but also enabling institutions. And very often you have both. So like for example with lynching that I'm going to focus on in a few minutes, uh, you have both obviously. You have institutions failing to protect the, the groups that were being targeted, the local institutions, the sheriffs, uh, also the federal institutions in the US, who, uh, which didn't do enough. But also you have these entire publics, right, that were complicit with lynching violence. Okay. And then there are at least three kinds of enablers. Those who enable the perpetration of violence by actively supporting or justifying uh, the violence, also, those who enable the pattern of violence by knowingly failing to act. And then finally, those uh, who become enablers by active ignorance, right? By cultivating a disregard or disengagement with the pattern of violence. Okay. And then enabling can be uh, grounded in uh, the following three things. And sometimes it's grounded in all of them in corrupted habits of mind, a corrupted sensibility, an insensitivity to the suffering, uh, being numbed to this suffering, uh, and having these epistemic biases that uh, prevent you from seeing what is going on or, or understanding it properly. But also these functions of public discourse. Uh, and notice, as I put it there, that there are all kinds of things that could count as these functions of public discourse. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on visual communication. And there are two obvious dysfunctions there. There are more, but there are two obvious dysfunctions. One is invisibility, not having an image, not having a sense of what is happening, uh, violence being socially invisible. But then also, something that is also a dysfunction of public discourse is hypervisibility. When you have a spectacle of violence so that you do see it, Perhaps you see it all the time. You see it on TV every night. But that's not creating a sensibility that prompts you to act and, and intervene and do something about it. Uh, you simply become a spectator right, to that violence. Uh, and I think we can understand how that can happen. For example, if we look at lynching photography, as I will do in a minute. And then finally, the role of the imagination, the social imagination. How the social imagination can be distorted in such a way that it becomes complicit with the perpetration of violence. And of course, that's very clear in the kind of imagination that was mobilized by the pro-lynching movement, the racist imagination that they articulated, both in pamphlets, in the discourses of uh, the pro-lynching movement, but also in images, in photography. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, activism is, uh, epistemic activism in particular, is the attempt to uh, critically intervene in all those dysfunctions, right, that I had before. The epistemic uh, biases of publics and institutions, the dysfunctions of public discourse, and the damaging, uh, stigmatizing social imaginaries or ideologies. Uh, and epistemic activism can happen in all kinds of ways, but when it comes to uh, 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 mobilizing epistemic activism against uh, racial violence, it has these three important dimensions that I'm going to focus on. The politics of collective memory, what is remembered and what is misremembered and what is not remembered at all. The politics of social perception, what people see and don't see. And the politics of the social imagination, what becomes imaginable and unimaginable. And you have to critically intervene in all those areas. And then, of course, I'm going to focus uh, on visual communication, uh, not in an arbitrary way or in a capricious way, but because images do carry a particular force to mobilize publics, to change public opinion, and to change public sensibility, right? 
not only to change people's minds in, in the sense of convincing them or some, of something, but in really shaping their sensibility, what they are attuned to, what they feel. Uh, okay, and of course, images have been used in activism for a long, long time, and in public education for a long, long time. Okay, uh, so now let me go to the second uh, uh, section, the second part of the talk, and I'll have to move quickly, uh, so feel free to come back to any of the slides that, that I'm gonna go over very fast in the Q&A if you're interested. So what I'm going to do is to talk about how the racist imagination was articulated uh, at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, and how photography was used for that. And then how that can be resisted, and how that was resisted by the anti-lynching movement, right? So the kind of epistemic activism that I'm gonna uh, tell you about has a long history. It's not just the photo activism that started with uh, you know, iPhones and, and smartphones and so on in, recently. It has a long, long history. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, it has to do a lot with how the modern and postmodern racist imaginary operated in a very ocular centric way, so that you know racial distinctions were inscribed in the body, and it had to do with how bodies were perceived and color skin plays such a big role. So visuality is there at the very center of racism, at least modern and contemporary racism, and the color obsession and the black and white binary. And there are all these interesting things in the background that I don't have time to explain. And notice also another thing, that I'm gonna be talking about the racist imagination at least in three ways, right? In, in, in what I have uh, left uh, of my time. The explicitly racist imagination, which is the imagination of the pro lynching movement. They were proudly racist. But then also what I'm going to claim is that once they were not in fashion anymore, once they didn't have social capital anymore, uh, nonetheless, the very visual imagination persisted, right, and was used, but now it wasn't declaring itself racist anymore. It was only implicitly racist. And we have even a third, so that would be like the second half of the 20th century, essentially, number two. But then more recently, we have what I would call the racist imagination in denial, that is still using the same images, and the same way of communicating visually about violence, but claiming not to be racist, right? And it is what a lot of people are calling post-racial, but what some other critics, including myself, uh, would claim is neo-racist. Not going beyond race or, and racism, but inhabiting racism or racist positionalities in a different way. Okay. Uh, now, and also another thing in the background, obviously, that is very important is this entire analysis that they started in the, in the 60s, right, with a famous book by Guy Debord, The Society of the Spectacle, in which he said, now with all these new technologies, and I mean, some of the technologies were simply photography, right, and television and so on, we're gonna be inundated by images. And we're gonna be so inundated by images that we're all going to become spectators, and it's gonna be very difficult to trace where these images come from and which ones are real and which ones are not real. But notice another, and of course I'm claiming that as soon as you have, I'm not using this as many people do to say, oh, the, the Guy Debord was right, right? We can look around today and see how, how true what he was saying is. I'm gonna use this actually retrospectively and say, he was actually right not only about the spectacles that are circulating today, he was right about the fact that once you have a technology that can disseminate images in this way, and you had that already with photography uh, at the end of the 19th century, you can create a spectacle, and you can have the problems of the spectacle already. And I'm claiming that that actually happened in lynching photography, and this practice of posing with lynch victims, taking photographs uh, at the lynching sites, turning them into postcards, selling them, sharing them. The creation of that spectacle was there. And notice another interesting thing about the society of the spectacle, is that it's not only people's agencies and ways of interaction that become mediated by the spectacle, it's that who they are, their identities, their own sense of self become mediated by the spectacle. So images become crucial, not only for the way in which people interact, uh, but also for the way in which people articulate who they are, right? Having a sense of self. So think about the selfie right, and the importance that it has today, right? And I'm claiming that for the formation of a public, for the formation of a community, images can play a crucial role. 
and it was essential, actually, for the formation of this white public that accepted lynching violence and normalized lynching violence to have these images of themselves, right? Okay, so with that said, and I'm, maybe I'll skip this because I don't wanna run out of time. Uh, well, I'll skip this. Let me just show this, this contrast. This is not lynching photography just yet, right? This is a execution photography. So this is a, a public execution in 1908. You have Mr. Henry Campbell there about to be executed and you have this big crowd. Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, public executions were prohibited in 1908, uh, but they continued, right, even after the, pro the federal prohibition. This was, allegedly at least, the last legal execution that happened in the United States. Uh, and the reason why I want to show you this is so that you can see a contrast between this spectacle, which I would say is also a very disturbing spectacle of racial violence, because most of the people executed in public were people of color. But there is a contrast, nonetheless, between this very disturbing spectacle and the spectacle that was about to come right after this, right, in the 20th century. And there are two points of contrast in particular that I think are fairly easy to see, just by comparing this image with the next few images I'm gonna show you. One is that Mr. Henry Campbell over there is looking dignified. And in fact, he shows his own clothing, and that's one thing that, uh, 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 people who were about to be executed had the prerogative to do. So he is dignified, and there is no reason why you should think that he's not a speaking body, right? That he has the capacity to speak, and in fact, before being executed, uh, people were given the choice to address the public, and many of them did. Uh, so all of that is going to change, so that in Lynch photography, the victim is going to appear as a dehumanized body, and a body that clearly cannot speak, either because it's, it's, it's a corpse, it's dead already, uh, or because the other disturbing uh, uh, things uh, that are clearly exhibited, such as the tongue taken out, uh, or being gagged. So the dehumanization of the victim is gonna happen in a very radical way. Uh, uh, that's one point of contrast. The other point of contrast is even though this was a disturbing spectacle mainly for white audiences, nonetheless, it wasn't exclusively for white audiences. And you have here a black lady looking back at the camera, and it was very typical to see at least some people of color who would show up, may, maybe family members, maybe friends, who would show up to give support to the person about to be executed. Now, that completely disappears in lynching photography. Why? Because it was explicitly a spectacle for white audiences only, right? And people of color were not allowed to visit uh, lynching sites. And of course, they didn't, right? They didn't stay home and they didn't visit lynching sites. So that is going to disappear. So part of what I want you to see, and also, uh, this happened in uh, Lawrenceville, Georgia in 1908. The next image I'll, I'm gonna show you, which is from uh, Lynch in photography, happened in the same town five years later, in Lawrenceville, Georgia in 1913. Uh, and there you're gonna see this process of the humanization of black bodies, right? Uh, the victim of lynching is either nude or the, whatever clothes are left are torn apart. Uh, the body is exhibited muted or inert and there is also uh, indications of mutilation or castration. Even though the images I'm gonna show you are really traumatic and disturbing, I show images that, uh, that uh, and I am presenting those images in such a way that you will not see a lot of the trauma, and you will not see mutilation or castration, but they are very hard, uh, and if you wanna look away, that's fine. I'm not gonna show you a whole lot of those images, but uh, I want you to see the reconfiguration of three photographic styles in these images. And that was very important for the creation of this visual imaginary, this visual imagination, right? The reconfiguration of family portraits, right? These images of white respectability, group portraits uh, of white people posing with a victim. And at the same time, the reconfiguration of how photography was used in the development of uh, criminology, right? And in, in police, uh, 
in, 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 in the police, right? The criminal mugshot. So you are going to have a combination of one and two, an image of res white respectability next to an alleged image of criminality. But then you're also going to have reconfigurations of hunting photography, right? Uh, people posing with the victim of lynching as they would pose with a, an animal trophy that they had hunted. And that's the next photograph, which, as I said, is in the same town five years later. Uh, that's the lynching of Mr. Hale, who you have uh, on the right side. Uh, and typically, the victims of lynching would be left hanging in the public square or outside town for at least 24 hours, sometimes two or three days, and people would pose with them. In this case, you have the proud hunters, right? But notice who were presumably the perpetrators of violence. But notice, you have a really big segment of the town behind them, posing with them as well, right? And this is uh, the, the, the killing, the lynching of Mr. Rubin Stacy in Fort Lauderdale, Florida in 1935. And there are many, many images of this lynching site with many white families like this one coming out in their best clothing, posing with the victim. Now, part of what is going on is that you have here the visual creation of a white respectable, respectable public that accepts the perpetration of racial violence, right? The normalization of racial violence, the creation of a white sensibility that allows for that. Uh, and you have it uh, done uh, in all these different ways by using the practice of posing for the camera, right? Uh, and by giving a new sense to everything that surrounded the practice of photography, including commercial slogans like go hunting, go Kodaking, that you would see display uh, all over the country, but also in the South, in places where you could buy you know, rifles and cameras at the same time, you could buy uh, your guns and your cameras, uh, and it was, you know, uh, unclear whether you were going to hunt uh, for animals or for human beings. And you have, this is the failure of the institution as well, right? You have even officials, right, even sheriffs, saying in the local newspapers, uh, you know, positive things about the lynching crowd. Like in this case, I, this, uh, this uh, sheriff says, I never saw a more orderly crowd of hunters in my life. And another thing that lynching photography does is to show this display of unity across class differences for white audiences so that you would have uh, uh, working class as well as middle class and upper class whites posing with the victims. And the role of women and children. Okay, this is the most disturbing or one of the most disturbing uh, lynching photographs and probably the most famous one, which is the double lynching of Mr. Smith uh, uh, and, and Mr. Uh, Yates in uh, 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 Marion, Indiana in 1935. And you have this famous uh, Hitler looking figure right pointing at the victims. And this is, again, Mr. Rubin Stacy and another white family. So uh, pay attention to this girl on the right and also these little girls on the left, because we're going to come back to that in a minute. Now, what I'm claiming is that picture taking and picture sharing themselves, those practices, the practice of taking pictures and the practice of sharing those pictures, those are practices of enabling violence. And those are ways of participating, actively participating, in the perpetration of violence. Picture taking was a way of recreating violence visually and reenacting the objectification and the physical degradation of the black victim. And notice I'm coming here to the famous analysis of photography by Susan Sontag, who Brian was uh, quoting earlier today. Uh, and as you may know, uh, Susan Sontag uh, called attention to the fact that we talk about the camera as a weapon, and even the language that we use, shooting, right, capturing the subject. All of that suggests that the camera offers a technology that can be used for symbolic violence, for, we can call it as she did, sublimated murder. Cameras capture the subject, they shoot the subject, and they offer, I claim, a symbolic rendition of the, in this case, lynching photography offers a symbolic rendition of the hunt and kill ritual of lynching, frozen in images. And picture sharing, so even if you didn't live in the South, even if you were not part of these communities or your grand-grandparents grand were not, people all over the country in the US 
uh, I mean, not everybody, but a lot of people all over the country participated in this horrible spectacle by buying a, a lynching postcards, by mailing them and sharing them in the privacy of their home. And that is a way of revisiting the violence, reenacting the violence, and being part of the violence. Okay? You are not simply a bystander. You are an active participant of this process of violence. Okay. Now, how was this resisted uh, in activist practices uh, in the anti-lynching movement and the, in the in NWACP, the National, Advancement, Advancement, uh, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People? I'm going to focus in particular on Ida B. Wells, right, and what she did. Uh, so notice one thing. One thing that anti-lynching activists did from the beginning to resist the spectacle of lynching, by, uh, lynching photography was to acquire as many lynching photographs as they could and destroy them, right? Ida B. Wells was one of the first people who said, no, I don't want to do that. The spectacle has already been created. The spectacle has already created this symbolic trauma among us. And I don't want that to be erased as if it didn't happen. I want to acquire as many of these images as possible, but I want to keep them for us. I want to create an archive so that we have it, and we have a historical record of what happened, and we can cultivate a collective memory of that really problematic culture of violence that was created, and we can revisit it. So she said, I'm going to use these images. I'm going to confront white publics with these images. And I'm going to tell them, and she did. And other activists in the NWACP did as well after her. She said, well, I know that these images have not been created for people like me. And I know that people consume these images in a different way, in the privacy of their home, right? And I know that they're going to feel incredible, incredibly uncomfortable when I confront them and I tell them what I see. But that's precisely what I want. I want that confrontation. I want them to feel uncomfortable. And I want them to look at these images with me and to see it through my eyes. I may not convince them of anything, but this kind of intervention right, is what I'm calling part of epistemic activism, a critical epistemic intervention that becomes really important. And we have pamphlets that were created by the NWACP with this kind of spirit of confrontation in mind. And this is one of them, using the last image that I showed you uh, of the lynching of Mr. Stacy and one of the white families. And you have a legend uh, at the bottom of the image of the pamphlet that I'm going to read in a minute so that you can see the kind of intervention that the pamphlet is trying to uh, accomplish. And you had in the back of the pamphlet uh, the encouragement to contact your representatives about the problem of lynching and so on and so forth. And this is what the pamphlet said at the bottom. Do not look at the Negro. His earthly problems are ended. Instead, look at the seven white children who gaze at this gruesome spectacle. Is it horror or gloating on the face of the neatly dressed seven-year-old girl on the right? Is the tiny four-year-old on the left old enough, one wonders, to comprehend the barbarism her elders have perpetrated? Ruben Stacy, the Negro lynch at Fort Lauderdale on July 19, 1935 for, quote, unquote, threatening and frightening a white woman, suffer physical torture. But what psychological havoc is being brought in the minds of the white children? Into what kinds of citizens will they grow up? And I have an entire analysis of this, but I need to move on so that we finish on time. Notice, another part of the epistemic activism of the NWACP was the famous black banner that was simply a way of calling attention, public attention, giving public visibility in the headquarters in Manhattan to instances of lynching, so that people shouldn't go on with their lives as if nothing had happened, and they should be mourning these incidents. OK, just very quickly, and I will have to go very, very quick, so that we can take at least a couple of questions. Uh, this is the epistemic activism against racial violence that has continued and reaches today. And you can think of epistemic activism in different ways as part of organized activism, uh, Black Lives Matter, for example, as an attempt uh, to change institutions, put pressure on, on institutions to do things differently, but also as part of a transformative agents, epistemic agency that people can have, uh, individuals, artists, educators, you in your daily life. And I'm going to focus in particular, I'll skip all this, on uh, an artist and his epistemic interventions, Ken Gonzalez Day. Uh, 
in the series arrays lynching, which is called arrays lynching also in two ways, for two reasons, right, in two senses. To call attention to the fact that lynching has been erased for, from collective memory to an important degree, but also he is uh, using the visual technique of erasing, so he's going to erase the lynch victims, so you're not gonna see lynch victims anymore, in order to call attention to these publics, these white publics, uh, that were participating in, in, in the spectacle of lynching. And this is what he says. The race lynching series initially began as an artistic response to the fact that racially motivated lynching and vigilantism had been underrepresented and even misrepresented in a number of historical texts when I began the project. My specific interest in this particular topic grew out of concern over the increased tensions that began to emerge along Mexico's border after 9-11. A new breed of vigilantes had begun to take up arms. Today, issues like the Michael Brown shooting have raised a whole series of new questions about racialized violence and its representation. I removed the lynch victim and the row from the image. This conceptual gesture was intended to redirect the viewer's attention away from the lifeless body of the lynch victim and towards the mechanisms of lynching and lynching photography to allow viewers to see the crowd the mechanisms of the spectacle, the role of the photographer, and even the impact of flash photography and their various influences on, the, uh, on our understanding of this dismal past. The perpetrators, when present, remain fully visible, jeering, laughing, or pulling at the air in a deadly pantomime, as such, this series strives to make the invisible visible. Okay. And finally, he says, as an artistic gesture, these absences or empty spaces become emblematic of a forgotten history in the billboard images. So these images were displayed sometimes in galleries, in museums, but also he rented billboards as close as possible to the lynch inside to exhibit these images as an invitation for the community to think about what was going on. In the billboard images, I strive to place this forgotten history back in the landscape and as a way of resisting the historical invisibility of so many of these events at times literally ground in this history in a historical, social, and physical landscape. Okay, so these are some of the images. The hunters gather on both sides of the tree. These people gather uh, around a telephone pole that was used for lynching. The back of a postcard. So that's how it appears in one of the galleries also transparencies that you'd walk around and you'd be facing the crowd. One of the billboard images, and here another billboard image. Okay, and I'm gonna claim that exposing lynching violence today also is part of this epistemic activism. And this is the way in which the killing of Mike, uh, the Trayvon Martin and uh, Michael Brown have been uh, revisited by activists. The very use of the term lynching, right? to talk about what happened to Trayvon Martin, this juxtaposition of victims of racial violence. There, the, the list of victims of uh, lynching, the famous uh, symbols, right? The skittle box, the hooded sweater, the hands up, don't shoot, and the expression of solidarity. And notice how the Ferguson protests were depicted, right? And you have images like the ones on the right in which you have the protesters, right, expressing something. But you also have images like the ones on the right that emphasize this violence and destruction of property and things like that. Look at the disproportionate display of military force confronting these activists, even more striking from this angle. Look at the juxtaposition, right? This is one of the juxtapositions that circulated in social media to call attention to the continuity of this fight against racial violence and how the American public probably wouldn't take any more uh, police dogs launching at activists, but we do accept this display of military force. Another juxtaposition, this one with a, a comment, the Civil Rights Act is 50 years old. These two pictures were taken 50 years apart. apart. Behold our progress. Another juxtaposition. 50 years apart, and now the black banner is back. But now sometimes it reads, a man was lynched by the police. And then, just to conclude, I'm claiming that we need communities of resistance that engage critically with the racist imagination, that the racist imagination is still alive, not in the same way as it was 
at the beginning of the 20th century, but it's still alive and it has not been shot dead just yet. We need to keep shooting and reshooting the racist imagination to neutralize it, to counter it. Uh, and this is, of course, something against uh, these claims about post-racialism. Uh, that we need to share responsibility for racial violence and to, uh, to pay attention to the epistemic dimension of that responsibility, and that we need epistemic activism and to cultivate epistemic activism in different ways. And I'll stop there because we are almost out of time, so thank you. But if we can take quickly maybe a couple of, yeah. yeah. I think we have time for maybe two questions. Um, this session is a recorded one, just so you know. And it doesn't have to be a question. It could be a comment, a reaction, I mean, anything. Uh, yeah, uh, wow, terrific presentation. Really insightful and informative. I just wanted to, to share something. I saw an interview with Hitler's personal secretary hmm. who was with him in the bunker before he shot himself, and she's one of our sources of historical information about the events leading up to Hitler's uh, suicide. And she said two things, both of which personally I believe. The first thing she said was, I didn't know that people were being gassed. And the second thing she said was, I sh looking back, I should have known. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually believe both those things. I believe that the the people had, as you say, they'd hidden from themselves mm -hmm. consciously what was going on. So you could be even Hitler's personal secretary and not have the information cross your desk. But at the same time, she had the honesty to admit, 50 years later, she said, looking at people like Sophie Scholl, in retrospect, I should have known. And I'm, I don't know if she used the word complicit, but that seemed to be the sense. Yeah. No, thank you so much. I mean, that's a great comment because uh, my notion of epistemic responsibility, right, which is crucial for this kind of epistemic activism, holding people accountable, uh, right, and making sure that you're epistemically responsible. My notion of epistemic responsibility is not just being responsible for what you know, or what you claim to know, or even for what you believe, it's also for what you don't know, your ignorance, the ignorance that you have inherited and that you cultivate. And one of the ways in which you can explain, and some people are mystified by that, how can I be responsible for what I don't know? How can I be responsible for my own ignorance? One of the ways in which you can motivate that is by saying, well, you didn't know, but maybe you should have known, right? Maybe there were ways in which you or your community or your family or your group could have looked into what was going on and you could have found out certain things about what was happening and you didn't have that kind of curiosity or diligence or preoccupation and that is already a problem. That's already a failure of epistemic responsibility. Yeah. I think Jasmine, just. Hi, I was just wondering if you could speak more to how we challenge hypervisibility, uh, given, I guess, the racist imagination is so alive, right? Given um, and 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 with Ken Gonzalez's uh, Gonzalez Day's um, mm -hmm. exhibition, I mean, I I can I would argue that one could insert in their minds the image of someone who has been lynched, and how that still, I guess, could I guess perpetuate racist imagination, even though it is visibly not there, the hyper-visibility that we've been, I mean, the hyper-violence and hyper-visibility that we've been conditioned to kind of already inserts these images in our heads, even if it's not there visibly. That's a great question, but can we take maybe another question and I'll try to answer, right? because, well, Jasmine had... Oh, wait, but I think you need the microphone. Um, so you talked about how um, reclaiming the visual images of lynching by um, Ida B. Wells um, has a way of um, like um, has a way of resisting the sort of um, epistemic violence done to the bodies. And I was wondering if you think um, that the um, it, you know it made me think of um, how um, Emmett Till's mother actually uh -huh. opened had an open casket for her for her son. And um, whether that is sort of like the, if you view that in the same in the, in the same way as resisting, like look at it through my eyes as my um, and not just this is not just another body. This is a son, 
something. Yeah. Well, they're both great questions. And actually, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm lucky today. I, I, I am in luck because the, the two questions for me speak to each other in a way. So let me start with your question. You're absolutely right. How do you fight a spectacle, right? How do you fight hypervisibility, as you said? Because it seems way easier to say, well, if the problem is invisibility, you just, you know, you just make it visible, right? If the, if the uh, pathology or, of public discourse, if the pathology of uh, visual communication is that there are no images about it, you go and create one. But if the pathology is hypervisibility, if there is a spectacle already uh, uh, functioning, it looks like everything you do is going to contribute to the spectacle. It's not going to be enough to create more images. It, and that's something that you can try, right? Counter images. But it has to be counter images that cannot be simply co-opted by the spectacle, can, cannot simply become part of the industry, the cultural industry that consumes these images. So there are a number, thi a number of things that you can do, right? One thing, you can refuse to be part of the visual spectacle, uh, which sometimes is not easy to do. You should uh, refuse to go see movies, right, or to go see shows or to turn on TV channels that are part of this spectacle. Uh, this is one of the reasons why the Whitney exhibit of lynching, of lynching photography, was so heavily criticized, because some people claim that it was contributing to the spectacle of racial violence. And even though the artists uh, repeated, no, 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 but my intention is to neutralize the spectacle, to go against it, but still the critics said, well, I don't care what your intentions are. It's still being publicized in such a way, and people are still participating in the exhibit in such a way that it is contributing to the spectacle and to this hyper-visibility. So you can't try to refuse to look at the images, to use the images, to revisit the images, but that's not easy to do sometimes. But then also, and this is the connection with Jasmine's question, you can try uh, to create a different form of visibility altogether. How should we remember lynching, the history of lynching? Maybe not by revisiting these images and looking at them again, but by looking at other images that express and capture the black suffering. And a lot of those images are images of mourning, right? Uh, in which the point is not just to look uh, at the gruesome spectacle of lynching, to look at the victim again, but to see black communities being destroyed and black communities coming together and expressing solidarity, right, as a reaction to what happened. And now within that alternative uh, collective memory and the images produced in it, you also find things like uh, the open casket funeral of Emmett Till, right, and what that meant. And I would claim that that's not a counter spectacle. Uh, that's not a spectacle at all. That is a different form of visibility. It's not a spectacular visibility. Uh, yeah. But there are some people who say uh, you can only fight a spectacle with another spectacle. That in order to neutralize a spectacle, you create a counter spectacle. But I'm very skeptical about that because I think you're still engaged in the same problematic dynamics. Uh, but you can try to create uh, an alternative image or set of images that are not spectacular. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi, I have two short questions. The first on the, on the children in the photographs. So you, you talked about it, but you deferred it for, and you were talking about the effect of this transmission on, uh, on, how, how, on their citizenship of the future. The second question was about the photographer. There's a photographer there, and um, what is the complicity of the photographer? And somehow I suspect, at least that in, in the contemporary discourse on photography, there's a, there is a sort of discourse on, uh, on say for example, conflict photography or uh, poverty photography and uh, the extent to which the photographer is complicit in, in sort of, in, uh, part, or, part, or a participant of sorts or benefiting from such, such uh, spectacles. So in this, in, perhaps it would be nice to hear you on both these issues. Yeah, thank you so much. Those are great questions. Uh, so let me start with the children uh, uh, and the role of the children in these images and all of that. Uh, and then I'll get to the role of the photographer. Uh, so one thing that is really interesting, right, 
is all these tensions, even seeming contradictions, right, in, in, the, in the use of uh, 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 lynching photograph. Uh, uh, and one of them is that on the one hand, part of the discourse of the pro-lynching movement was that uh, uh, black rapists and black criminals had to be neutralized uh, by any means necessary for the sake of protecting women and children, right? And there was this entire narrative about what we call today the myth of the black rapist and so on, this black menace, right? Uh, and the, the part of the cover for that kind of violence was we need to protect uh, our women and children, right? And then at the same time, women and children were encouraged, sometimes even forced, uh, to look at this gruesome spectacle of violence, right? Uh, and to pose with the victim and all of that. And there are different analyses of that and how to make sense of that tension. Uh, and one way of thinking about it is that, well, maybe that is what they thought the normalization and social acceptability of violence meant, right? That you had to show that after this alleged, you know, rapist and criminal had been neutralized, now the social order was restored, and now women and children could come out uh, and could be, you know, po could be posing uh, in public uh, and looking happy and all of that, even though they were looking happy and, and exhibiting this kind of respectability and normalcy next to this, uh, uh, you know, mutilated uh, uh, body, which, which looks absurd. But it is like, well, the absurdity didn't apparently feel like an absurdity to them because of this mindset that was claiming that's the price, right, that we pay for the return to the social order, for social peace, this unspeakable violence. Uh, so it did, but it is very disturbing and very strange that women and children were deployed right, in these images in the way in which they did. Uh, 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 and I agree with that. Uh, and that is part of what the pamphlet also is calling attention to, right? How, whatever you think about uh, the victim of lynching, whatever you think about black suffering, what is that doing to white communities and to white sensibility that you are creating a sensibility for which you are, a, you are going to accept this level of violence, right? And you are going to integrate it in your, in your life. Uh, and now, just quickly about the pho photographer. One thing that is interesting, right, is that it was precisely around the time that lynching photography was developed and it became such a social, cultural spectacle and so on, that uh, Kodak cameras, uh, Polaroid cameras, became affordable. Not by everybody, I mean, they were not incredibly cheap, but they were cheap enough so that you didn't have to hire a photographer anymore. You could, I mean, most uh, middle class families could afford uh, a camera and take their own camera with them. Now, uh, I think uh, we can think both about the role of the professional photographer and the responsibility of the professional photographer, but we can also think about how people become the producers of their own images and they become photographers themselves, right? Obviously, in the same way in uh, uh, the bourgeois portrait, in the same way that when a bourgeois family hires a professional, he's not... Uh, uh, free to take whatever image of the family he wants to take, right? It's not up to his discretion to create any kind of image of this family. The job is, you better show that we are a respectable, good-looking family, right? Uh, and the same seems to be true about lynching photographs that were taken by professionals. They were hired to give a particular kind of image of white respect respectability and black criminality. Uh, that was part of the job. But I think you're absolutely right Taking that job comes with certain responsibilities, right? You are willingly enter into this contract for which you are compensated that includes the creation of this image. And then when that is not uh, a professional uh, endeavor anymore, and you just do it yourself, the families uh, take the cameras in their own hands, then you have to take responsibility, right, for taking the picture, for posing with the, for, with the victim. Uh, uh, and all of that. But I think you're absolutely right. There are different responsibilities here, right? The person taking the, the picture, the composition of the picture, the people consuming the picture and using it in a practice, yeah. Okay, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. I know. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
And let's thank Robin also for the wonderful organization and everything.